Henry VIII is definitely not one of history's forgotten people. But equally, he is a figure that has become mired in legend and rumour, and much of the context for his actions is far less well known than it should be. So, why did King Henry VIII of England want a son so desperately? First, we have to go all the way back to Henry's early life, he was born on the 28th of June, 1491, and was never intended to be a king. He was a spare, not an heir. That honour fell to his older brother, Arthur, who was already five years old when Henry was born. They were born, along with their two sisters, Margaret and Mary, to King Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, and represented the hopes of their family and country that they could bring peace after years of war. Henry VII had taken the crown on the battlefield, winning a victory against Richard III and settling the Wars of the Roses that had plagued England's peace for decades. He was from the House of Lancaster, whereas Elizabeth of York, as her name might suggest, was from the House of York. Her parents were King Edward IV and his Queen Consort Elizabeth Woodville, and in the wake of the disappearance of her brothers, the Princes in the Tower, Elizabeth held the dominant claim for the Yorkists. Henry had gained his claim for the crown from his mother, Margaret Beaufort, who was a great-granddaughter of John of Gaunt. Henry and Elizabeth's marriage had ignited hope that the houses of York and Lancaster could be united together and finally bring peace to the kingdom. Their children were the literal symbols of this. Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, despite having a political marriage of convenience, fell in love over the years. Both were faithful to one another, and Elizabeth of York was a devoted wife to her husband, who helped support him as king. No doubt this had an effect on the young Henry, who, although royal children did not spend as much time with their parents as children do now, will have been aware of their affectionate relationship. Henry was also deeply fond of his mother, and the two may have had a closer relationship than Elizabeth was able to have with her firstborn son, who was sent to Ludlow Castle. Comparison of handwriting between Elizabeth of York and Henry VIII shows similarities, suggesting she taught her young son how to read and write. The young queen was also known as Elizabeth the Good and was known for being kind and sweet-natured. This would have a great effect on the young prince, helping to form his ideas about how a queen should be. This would only be compounded by two tragic events that were about to befall the tightly knit royal family. On the 2nd of April, Prince Arthur, heir to the throne, died at 15 years old of a severe illness. His new wife, Catherine of Aragon, survived, but his death must have been devastating for his parents. Prince Henry, as the only surviving son, was now thrust into a role he was unprepared for. Not only had he lost his elder brother, but he was now the new Prince of Wales, amongst other titles, and had to be groomed for a crown he hadn't expected. But unlike his brother, Henry was not sent to Ludlow Castle as was traditional, but instead was kept at Eltham Palace. He rarely went out into public and was supervised closely at all times. Henry's first public appearance had been at around age 10, when he was part of his brother's wedding. Reginald Pole, a cousin of the king, would claim this was because his father, Henry VII, hated Henry. There is very little to back this up, however. While it is true that Henry was kept close and didn't speak unless asked a question by the king, knowing the affection Henry VII held for his family documented through letters and the giving of gifts, it seems more likely the prince's father was scared of something happening to his remaining son, having lost three already. In short, the prince's father seems to have grown so anxious about losing his second son and keeping him close, 
that young Henry would grow up somewhat untrained for his role as king. Sadly, on her 37th birthday, Elizabeth of York also died shortly after giving birth to a daughter who also lived only a few days. The loss was immense, probably made worse by the recent death of Prince Arthur, and Henry VIII would later state that never had he been given more hateful news. His father, Henry VII, was heartbroken, and it's clear that Elizabeth's death left a void in their family. But more than this, his mother's death would elevate her to a status that no woman could ever realistically reach. Elizabeth of York, in death, would never age, would never grow bitter or old, and her every positive trait was magnified to saint-like levels. In the wake of these tragedies was left an awkward leftover. Arthur's widow, Catherine of Aragon. She had been married to Arthur for just a few months, and for a while, no one was sure what to do with her, at least until it was arranged that she should marry Prince Henry. Both Queen Isabella and Henry VII were keen to continue to forge an alliance between England and Spain, and so Henry was a perfect choice to fill the gap. The main problem with this was that she had been married to Henry's brother, and so was technically his sister-in-law, but it was nothing a papal dispensation couldn't fix. Catherine would always be adamant, right from Arthur's death until her dying day, that the young couple had never consummated their marriage. It's certainly possible. While they had a public bedding ceremony, they were merely left alone after being tucked into bed, and there was no guarantee anything had happened, especially given their age. But nevertheless, Henry VII had his doubts, and instead requested a dispensation for affinity. This allowed for the possibility of consummation. Keeping his options open, Henry VII kept Henry betrothed to Catherine, while equally not committing to a wedding date until her dowry was paid. In truth, he was scoping out other possible wives for Henry. However, once Catherine's mother, Isabella of Castile, passed away, a link to a united Spain faded, as Catherine's elder sister, Juana, took the Castilian crown. It made things complicated. And in 1506, when Henry reached the age of 14, the canonical age for boys to be allowed to marry, the prince decided he did not want to marry Catherine after all, claiming the reason was that the betrothal had been conducted without his consent. It seems far more likely that this was a decision imposed by his father than one a teenage boy would make by himself. Ferdinand of Aragon, Catherine's father, acted quickly. In order to maintain his daughter's importance and keep links with England, her father made Catherine his unofficial ambassador in England. It retained some importance for her. Henry's father was clearly nervous about the possibility she had consummated the marriage to Arthur, and Henry himself was now seemingly reluctant to marry his brother's widow. In fact, Catherine would spend eight years in England after Arthur's death not knowing what would happen to her. She began to believe it was God's will that she marry Henry, even if he was against it for now. But on the 21st of April 1509, Henry VII died after a long illness that had kept him in poor health. Catherine's wish was granted, as Henry, now Henry VIII of England, reversed his decision and decided he did want to marry her after all. He claimed it was his father's dying wish, but there is no evidence either way, and it could just as easily be his own. Conveniently, it also got Henry out of marrying Eleanor of Austria, who his father had matched him with, but was currently just 11 years old, probably not as attractive a prospect for a young 18-year-old who wanted to have his own heirs as soon as possible. Catherine and Henry also knew each other fairly well by this point, and both had gifted each other jewels and expensive items at New Year's. 
Having said that, Henry often recycled Catherine's gifts for other people, whereas Catherine treasured those he gave her. It was, perhaps, a sign of things to come. On the 11th of June, the young couple were married in a quiet ceremony in Greenwich at the Friars' Church. It was a strange comparison to the lavish wedding of his own parents, in which they had felt the need to celebrate the coming together of the houses of York and Lancaster. The same could have been decided for a union between England and Spain, but perhaps issues with the dispensation meant Henry wanted to keep it quiet. They were described as a handsome couple, and Catherine especially was described as beautiful and goodly to behold. A few days later, at midsummer on the 24th of June, they were jointly crowned at Westminster Abbey. The festivities for this were so resplendent that Catherine wrote to her father saying, Our time is spent in continuous festival. Everyone was pleased with England's young, gorgeous power couple, and it would seem Henry had his romance, just as his parents had. But Catherine's mind was on other matters, as within weeks of their marriage, she was pregnant. Elizabeth of York, Henry's mother, had fell pregnant equally as fast after her marriage, and the resulting Prince Arthur was a stabilising force for Henry VII, strengthening his hold on the throne. Henry VIII had a much more stable position than his father had had, and yet having a son would allow him the security of knowing his dynasty would continue. But sadly, Catherine gave birth on the 31st of January 1510 to a stillborn baby girl who was premature. There was sadness, and yet the couple were young, and no one worried too much about it yet. Just a few months later, Catherine had conceived again, and this time she gave birth to a seemingly healthy baby boy on New Year's Day 1511. He was named Henry after his father and grandfather, and there was joyful celebration. But just seven weeks later, the little boy died in his cot at Richmond Palace, possibly of what we would now call cot death. This time, there was real mourning for his death. Catherine would go on to have two more stillborn sons in 1513 and 1515. Henry had already grown bored with his new wife in 1510, however, with the first of many short-lived mistresses. It's hardly surprising that by this point, relations were strained between husband and wife. But just like her mother, Isabella of Castile, Catherine knew it was better to turn a blind eye to these fly-by-night fancies of the king, especially when she was yet to provide him with a living heir. But on the 18th of February, 1516, her prayers finally came true when she gave birth to a healthy little girl named Mary. Mother and daughter were to become very close over the years. While she was female, Mary was the first of the king's children to survive more than a few weeks and was immediately given a nursery and household fit for a royal princess with the king's cousin Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, placed in charge of Mary's welfare. The king was reportedly very fond of his little daughter and often boasted of her accomplishments, but he was still desperate for a son. The Tudor nervousness of holding on to the crown that had plagued his father must have bothered Henry VIII, perhaps remembering that his grandmother, Margaret Beaufort, had thrown everything in helping Henry VII survive as he was her only son, and the pressures heaped on himself as his father had no siblings to dole positions of power out to, as well as the fears his father must have made clear when Prince Arthur died, leaving him also only with one son. Either way, relations with Catherine improved after Mary's birth, but it didn't stop Henry going off with yet another mistress in the same year, this time with a woman named Elizabeth, or Bessie, Blount. She would be significant in that it wasn't a quick fling, and in 1519, 
she gave birth to a healthy son. Henry was so ecstatic about the birth of his son and now having the ability to prove he could father healthy sons that he publicly acknowledged the boy as Henry Fitzroy, his son, and possibly made him part of the royal nursery. However, he was not a legitimate heir and there was still time for Catherine to have a son. Catherine must have felt awful, especially as the year before in 1518, she had once again given birth to another still child, a daughter this time. Everything came to a head in 1525. The king's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, was invested as Duke of Richmond, a move many saw as a possible future path to the crown. Catherine was now 40 years old, Henry VIII was 36, and time was running out for the Queen to produce another healthy heir. Henry's fears from both his upbringing and his religious study began to raise their ugly head, and slowly he became convinced that God was punishing him for marrying his brother's wife. Was this really how he felt? It's possible. Henry VIII, for all his faults, was considered very devout for the time in which he lived, and he knew a lot about scripture thanks to his interest and education. He also knew his father had been broadly against the marriage, something which perhaps stayed in the back of his mind. It was also around this time that Henry became enamoured with a beautiful young lady-in-waiting to the Queen, Anne Boleyn. Anne wasn't stupid, however, and she had seen how the king had cast aside her sister Mary Boleyn, who had also been his mistress for a time. She refused his advances, but it's clear from Henry's letters to her that he truly believed he was falling in love with her in a way he never had with Catherine. In short, Henry may have wondered whether this was the romance he had been searching for, the one to replicate his parents' own relationship. Henry began to ponder his options, something which became known as the King's Great Matter. He could marry Mary off and hope for a grandson in his lifetime, legitimise Henry Fitzroy, or find a way to put Catherine aside and marry again, his eyes firmly on Anne Boleyn for a wife replacement. By 1527, he had convinced himself the most attractive option was to marry Anne Boleyn, who was herself, with fervent pushing from the power-hungry males in her family, also demanding a wedding ring. Henry used the argument that in marrying Catherine, his brother's wife, he had acted contrary to Leviticus 20.21, and so he was being punished for this, and would never have a healthy male heir as long as they remained married. He probably hoped Catherine wouldn't argue about it and quietly retire to a nunnery, but as a daughter of the warrior Queen Isabella, she was not so easily pushed to one side. Many tried to stop him breaking with Rome. Martin Luther argued that the Bible did not allow for divorce, but did allow for polygamy at times, so why not simply take a second wife? The Pope even offered a dispensation for Henry Fitzroy to marry his half-sister Mary in order to secure the dynasty and allow for royal heirs. A combination of Henry VIII's stubbornness to believe other opinions over his own learned ones, fears that he would be the end of the so far short-lived Tudor dynasty, that he would be the one who lost the crown his father had fought so hard for, coupled with his religious convictions, seems to have made up his mind. By 1530, Catherine was banished from court and her rooms were given to Anne Boleyn. On the 14th of November 1532, the King and Anne were married secretly. By May 1533, the marriage between Catherine and Henry was deemed unlawful at a special court headed by Thomas Cranmer at Dunstable Priory. But the most significant part of these events 
was the breaking with the Church of Rome. Up until this point, Henry had been a devout Catholic, and it was even said that divorcing from Catherine caused him great sorrow. While the cynical amongst us may doubt that, it is possible for that to be true of Henry, as well as him being someone who still wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, so strong was his desire for a male heir. And it's likely that, had Anne given birth to a few sons, the matter would have been seen as resolved by many, and Henry would not have remarried again. However, it was not to be. Anne had already been pregnant when she was crowned Queen Consort on the 1st of June 1533. Their marriage had been confirmed legitimate, their issue legitimate for the throne, and young Princess Mary was now cast aside as well, no longer the heir to the throne. On the 7th of September that year, Anne gave birth at Greenwich Palace to a baby girl, who would be named Elizabeth. It was a severe blow for both Henry and Anne, but there was time yet for a son. Added to this was the fact that their marriage wasn't turning out to be the hoped-for romance at all. While a sharp wit and political acumen were attractive in an illicit mistress, they were less attractive in a queen consort, who was expected to support her husband in all matters. The couple regularly argued and fought. By Christmas 1534, Anne gave birth to a child who was stillborn. Henry started having discussions with Thomas Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell over how to leave Anne without having to return to Catherine. Quite what he was thinking at this point is unknown. He had left Catherine under the somewhat horrible but arguable stance of God doesn't want me married to my sister-in-law, but there wasn't really any argument with Anne. Nothing came of it, and by the summer of 1535 they were reconciled and Anne was once again pregnant by October. She must have felt the pressure far worse than Catherine ever had to deliver a boy. On the 8th of January 1536, Catherine of Aragon died. Henry and Anne chose to wear yellow for the mourning period and it's uncertain whether this stood for the English symbolism of yellow as a colour of joy or the Spanish symbolism as a colour of mourning. Probably both to cover all bases. It was also not long after this that the king began to show affections towards one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting in an ominous repeat of how their relationship had begun. This woman was Jane Seymour, and unfortunately for Anne, matters were made worse for her when she miscarried a child after just four months of pregnancy, who was thought to have been a boy. Had she given birth to a healthy male child, she might have been saved. But instead, Henry found a way to have her brought upon horrific charges of incest with her brother, along with treason, and she was promptly beheaded. With his first wife Catherine also dead, there was nothing to stop Henry marrying Jane on the 30th of May, 1536, just mere weeks after Anne's execution. Jane was the opposite of Anne in many ways. She was said to be quiet, gentle and conservative in her tastes and ways. She also wasn't as highly educated as Henry's first two wives, preferring needlework to literature, and this was probably attractive to Henry after the blazing rows with Anne. Jane was never crowned as the plague was rampant in London at the time, but it's also probable Henry wanted this time to wait to have his new wife crowned as Queen Consort until she had delivered him a son. He didn't have long to wait. In January 1537, Jane had conceived and went into confinement in September of that year. Henry must have been elated at the news that at last his third wife had given him the much longed for son on the 12th of October 1537 at Hampton Court Palace, who would be named Edward. Edward. 
this single act would position Jane, although she never took any part in great political governing or decision for her country, as Henry's favourite queen. However, in an echo of Henry's mother, Elizabeth, dying shortly after her last child, Jane succumbed to a possible postpartum infection and died on the 24th of October. A lavish Queen's funeral was planned for her and Henry fell into deep mourning, wearing only black for two years afterwards. Jane was the unhappy carrier of his legitimate heir and it would elevate her to a status above all his other wives as the mother to the Tudor prince and continuation of his dynasty. It would be another two years before Henry would consider marrying again, this time for political reasons, to Anne of Cleves. His next wife, Catherine Howard, was pushed forward by her uncle Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, who saw his opportunity for power. A year after her death, Henry was probably looking for a companion rather than a sexy lover, and Catherine Parr, part of his daughter Mary's household, caught his eye. After their marriage in July 1543, Catherine took on the role of stepmother for the king's three children, and was responsible for his reconcilement to Mary and Elizabeth, bringing them back into the royal fold. It seems that Henry had, by this point, accepted that he would only have one son to continue after him. Henry Fitzroy had died in 1536, and Edward was often poorly. Henry VIII himself now suffered from ill health, and a jousting accident in 1536 may have contributed to the mood swings and tempers he was prone to. It is difficult to know exactly how Henry felt about the decisions he had made in his pursuit of a romantic relationship like his parents, or his quest for a son to cement the dynasty his father had fought so hard for. But a new discovery does give some hints of Henry's notes in the margins of a book authored by Catherine Parr, his final wife. This was a luxurious book, coloured by hand on vellum, titled Psalms or Prayers. In it, Henry marked out several passages, suggesting the thoughts on which he brooded. He marked out passages on illness and plagues, perhaps thinking of his own poor health. And he also shows interest in passages asking for God's forgiveness and wisdom. Give me a new heart and a right spirit, and take from me all wicked and sinful desires. It would seem that Henry was not without heart then, and was regretful at the actions he had taken in his life, especially at his treatment of the women he was supposed to protect as their husband. Whatever his thoughts, Henry VIII finally died on the 28th of January 1547 at the age of 55. Henry's radical and controversial changes to religion and wives were not the random decisions of a mad king, however, but the result of many complex and difficult situations throughout his life. His childhood had been marred by the shadow of the Wars of the Roses, in which no doubt his grandmother, Margaret Beaufort, his father, Henry VII, and his mother, Elizabeth of York, told him their stories. Their lives had been one of constant chaos, and their marriage and establishment of the Tudor dynasty a soothing solution to end the upheaval of war and loss. This created a heavy burden for the sons of Henry VII, himself an only child with no siblings to have in the wings, knowing they had to carry that fledgling dynasty forward. And with the death of Prince Arthur, not only had Henry lost a brother, but he gained that burden all for himself. The stability of the Tudors rested on him having a son himself, preferably more than one. Added to this was the relationship he saw between his parents and the loss of his beloved mother, who he would always then place upon a pedestal. 
It was even suggested that Jane, his third wife, reminded him of his mother in how sweet-natured and kind she was, and she may have filled an Elizabeth of York-shaped void for the king. The lack of the same kind of relationship for him meant he was frustrated in his marriages and always looking to one side for the next best thing. Added to this was his urgent desire to have a son and his entire focus became centred on this single issue to the exclusion of all else. Hence this once pious man was ready to cast aside the Church of Rome in pursuit of the legacy of his family and the name of Tudor. And in the desperation passed down from Henry VII and Margaret Beaufort for their family's claim to the throne, Henry would trigger decades of religious unrest and rebellion, which ironically would only be calmed not by his son, but by his second daughter, Elizabeth I. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.